from inside Memorial Stadium in the Huskers Radio Network studio. It's the Husker Nutrition Podcast, brought to you by Midwest Dairy, representing your local dairy farm families. Here's your host, Jessica Cootie, with Director of Performance Nutrition, Dave Ellis. Well, Dave, I know Nebraska fans have heard all about how, you know, the Huskers have been at the forefront and really basically created sports nutrition, right, in, in college athletics. But you are also a big part of that. And maybe a lot of people haven't heard your background, your story. So I thought it would be interesting to kind of go back to the beginning. I know you started in strength and conditioning and graduated from here at the University of Nebraska. But what drew you to the nutrition part of it? Back when you were in college, um, you know, I had a genuine curiosity for the science behind fueling, right? And um, there really wasn't an outlet to do it full time, other than to play a functional role as either an athletic trainer or a strength coach, and do nutrition on the side, right? And that, at that point, you know, we're talking 80, 1982, and. Yet, there was a head coach here, Tom Osborne, who was so far ahead of his time mm -hmm. on understanding and valuing nutrition. And he was into it um, because he had, was suffering from some challenges with his own cardiovascular health. And at the time, taking some very restrictive um, steps to try to improve his diet with what the science was telling us at the time. And so like, I had this advocate. I had this advocate for awesome. nutrition before probably any college coach in America, before it was a twinkle in their eye at all, right? Uh, and Tom, you know, was literally the kind of head coach that once he knew what my passion was, would turn around to me and talk to me about subjects that, you know, we hadn't even covered in my curriculum in college. And yet turned out to be very big trends like using fish oil. And so, you know, talk about the luck, right? I, I kind of look back and I can't hardly fathom how lucky I got to be in a, be in the right place at the right time, where I, while I started out as a strength coach, got to grow into the nutrition responsibilities over time. And it was really kind of an organic deal, like, hey, can you start doing the body fats on the athletes? Yeah, sure, yeah, no problem. Um, hey, uh, you know, some of the guys were losing their crackers over here at lunch while we were running eight, eight eighties today and four forties. Can you change the menus at lunch so they're not going to have that? Sure, coach, no problem. You know, like it was just one fix after another to where eventually uh, it manifested into something opportunistically ahead of its time. Was there something that piqued your interest in it, like maybe a, a certain story or an athlete, or did it just kind of develop when you were going through your strength and conditioning program? Where did just the, because there wasn't much of it back then, right? I mean, mm -hmm. and, and how far we've come and where we are now, but back then the, you didn't have all of this. So no. where did it kind of come from? Like, hey, I want to kind of figure out how this plays into athletes' performances. Yeah, right. Um, sadly, I, I would say most of the information when I got started in this field was like popular press, muscle magazine, bros, what we would call bro science today, right? <laughs> you know, like just stuff that people were probably like kind of uh, just making up as they went. And yet along the way, we had a head athletic trainer here, uh, the late, great George Sullivan, um, who was also, uh, you know, the kind of guy who said, hey, Dave, you know, check these journals out. These are credible places to look for information. Matter of fact, you may want to go to the American College of Sports Medicine meetings. This is a group that gets together and talks about things that are relevant to sports. Sometimes nutrition comes up. And actually, George was the guy that sent me off to get my training on how to do skin folds correctly uh, years and years and years ago. And so I have to you know, also give George some credit and certainly uh, Boyd Epley as the head strength coach certainly wanted a bigger return on the work that they were doing with the athletes. And so he was a facilitator in a very big way when it came to always lobbying for better fueling. And so there, I just had, again, wonderful circumstances here at Nebraska. So can you take me through, um, you know, it's one thing for Coach Osborne to be interested in all of it and, mm -hmm. and be picking your brain, but then to establish the very first you know, department of this kind mm -hmm. at any kind of collegiate athletic, you know, department. How did that kind of come about and how did that conversation go between you and Coach Osborne? Well, 
I actually left Nebraska and was with Alvarez his first four years at Wisconsin. And um, I was doing a dual role at Wisconsin, also on the strength, conditioning, and nutrition front for all the aforementioned reasons. There was no full-time position. But, you know, while I was at Wisconsin, we were having some success got getting that program turned around with the first Rose Bowl victory and um, that they'd ever had. And, and Nebraska was, you know, to their credit, tracking where some of their previous people were at and what they were doing. And suddenly I got word that, hey, Nebraska would like to bring you back and have you interview for the first full-time nutrition position, uh, sports nutrition position in college athletics. And of course, that was a great opportunity I couldn't pass up um, to get back and to a progressive environment like Nebraska, where really the first structure for high performance was coming together, you know, nutrition, strength conditioning, sports psychology. We had Jack Stark in place when I came back. Um, you know, we really didn't have an, a, our version of what is now the NAPL. We didn't have an exercise science component at that time. But still, just the performance team concept for high performance was just starting to come together and to be the first director of sports nutrition for that concept was a um, fabulous opportunity. And so Coach Osborne, behind the scenes in his very uh, unauspicious way, you know, was really, I'm sure, a key cog uh, in stimulating the opportunity to, to exist and as long with, with medicine and strength. Uh, you know, fans can travel and see football stadiums, but, you know, they may not see what these facilities look like from the inside and what don't get, maybe always get an inside access look to what you guys are doing with these athletes. We're overlooking you know, the new facility over here where your train, new training table is going to be. But can you maybe give fans a sense of, um, I mean, Nebraska is the best of its kind in, in nutrition and sports nutrition and, and how it helps athletes prepare, just kind of where, you know, it stacks up and how you guys continue to stay at the top. Yeah, so infrastructure is part of it. Um, we've always had great facilities, great support services. That was, you know, at the, f the fundamental fabric of our recruiting uh, to get people to stop in and take a look. And, you know, along the way, the safety of the environment, the quality of the people, um, our academic support services, uh, really it probably got a lot of people that just curiously came by to see what was going on to, to stay. And so that's part of our formula that will never change. The new facility going in right now is going to set the bar globally, actually, when it comes to the training table that I'm putting, that I've designed and put together. There will be people from all over the country that want to get a look under the hood and see what we're doing once this is up and running. But most importantly, it will be more you know, the recruits and their families that want to get in here and take a look. And along the way, will probably take a chance on us, right? So that's a long history there of that infrastructure and support services being better than average and, and setting the bar, right? Uh, and those things together really becoming a massive stimulus for people to come in and, and take a look. And we're not just talking about football. And there mm -hmm. are a lot of places that they just kind of focus and build their structures to cater to the football teams. Um, but you guys, it's it's mm -hmm. all about the all of the programs, and it's a family feel down there. I had uh, Greg Austin on the podcast a few weeks ago, and he was talking about how his guys, when he walks down there, they're not on their phones. They're kind of engaging in conversation, and you get to know a lot of the other student athletes. There seems to be a camaraderie amongst the student athletes that a lot of it is built at your training table. Yeah, imagine that um, we probably, from an equity perspective, have been doing more for all our sports than anybody for the longest period of time in the fueling space. Coach Osborne, uh, when they won the kickoff classic against Penn State, took those revenues, uh, had the training table renovated and, uh, and opened in 1985. And since that date, you could say we've been ahead of everybody when it came to giving all our athletes uh, revenue, non-revenue, male, female, a, a place to commingle, eat the same food supply, the same number of days that everybody, you know, football would get it, everybody gets a shot at it. And that's great. I mean, that was really made that a unique melting pot for our athletes to get to know each other, our coaches to commingle, our staff to commingle. And, you know, when it's hard to get into somebody's office for a meeting, the ability to cross paths and do business, quite frankly, 
um, in a very, um, you know, relaxed atmosphere, less formal atmosphere over a meal. It's probably helped us get ahead on a lot of different fronts that we can't even imagine. The Husker Nutrition Podcast is brought to you by Midwest Dairy. Finish strong with chocolate milk, a natural source of high quality protein to build lean muscle. The right mix of carbs and protein proven to refuel exhausted muscles, fluid and electrolytes to rehydrate and replenish critical nutrients lost in sweat. You put in the hard work on the field. Chocolate milk will support your recovery off the field. Trusted by athletes, supported by science. Continuing our conversation with Dave Ellis. Uh, Dave, not only do you have the best facilities, you also have the best staff, so much so that one of your staff members, uh, Nuwani Tamaki, is in Japan as mm. we speak at the Tokyo Olympics, mm. assisting Team USA. How cool is that for as her boss, but for this program to have somebody at the best of the best at the most uh, you know prestigious Olympic competition in the, in the world? Yeah, it is. It's very cool. Um, Nuwani was out at the Olympic Training Center. I lived in Colorado Springs for 14 years before I came back uh, to work with the Huskers um, three seasons ago when Scott came back. And well, I got to know Nuwani from living in the Springs and interfacing with uh, a number of the staff at the Olympic Training Center. And when it became evident that she was going to be available and I was just coincidentally trying to restaff all of our full-time sports nutrition positions, here upon arrival in Lincoln, um, we got lucky. We got lucky to land Nuwani because she's a specialist that has worked with weight restrictive sports where cutting body weight, hitting a weight class is part of the business of the sport, right? Wrestling, uh, there's a number of Olympic disciplines, judo, boxing, um, that aren't college sports, but nonetheless, um, you know, the approach works here for our wrestlers in particular. Gymnastics is a, a weight restrictive sport to some degree, even though they don't have weight class. Swimming and diving, diving in particular has got some restrictions on uh, body mass, um, on and on and on, well, gym, you know, gymnastics. Nuwani is a specialist in all these, with all those athletes, and I've put her with those sports. And so believe me, they absolutely adore what she does. And she works with the volleyball team also. And so Nuwani is uh, one of our, you know, really high achievers. We have th three full-time sports dietitians in addition to myself that we spread uh, all the 24 sports, 650 athletes over those four dietitians in totality. And then we've lucky enough on top of all that to have a number of graduate assistant dietitians who are just here to get experience that end up getting great jobs that we just placed uh, Iowa State sports dietitian University of Tennessee sports dietitian and the sports dietitian at LSU. Um, and since I got back here in the last three years, as well as some in our spec ops community in the military. So people are following what we're doing here. Um, we're trying to set the bar. I mean, at the end of the day, we set it a long time ago. And, you know, I can honestly say that what we're doing right now and what we've got planned will be very hard for people to catch up with. That's what it's all about in sports, right? It's about making uh, these support services and these facilities yield a return on their investment when it comes to helping our athletes outwork the competition. Yeah, let's talk about where you're moving forward those plans yeah. because I know your training table is going to be immaculate and people that are listening might have maybe donated to the project, might be thinking about donating to the project. Um, how important is what you are doing and, and your part of this new facility that's going up out here? Well, imagine there's three levels of the facility, a ground level where the football locker rooms and therapeutic spaces and the weight room will be. The next level up is kind of street level, um, not field level, but street level. And that will be the academics and training table. Um, and then we'll go up one more level, the top level, and you've got mainly football offices and meeting rooms up there. And, you know, 300,000 square feet between the weight room and all of these other spaces is enormous. And, um, you know, then the, the fact that we're connected to the stadium where there's massive infrastructural space, we're, we're square footage wealthy here when it comes to not being landlocked and boxed in. And what we're getting ready to do will take decades for people to catch up 
with, and that's critical in sports. And so the training table infrastructure that I've laid out for the future space, uh, we're growing from about 12,000 square feet to over 20,000 square feet. And, you know, everything that was rate limiting on, that we had outgrown in our old space that we're currently operating in, which by the way, people would kill to have, um, <laughs> will all be remedied in the new space. And so, you know, a comfortable environment where at peak times everybody can get in, move quickly, stay on schedule, and yet maybe the most important thing, it will stimulate them to build healthier plates. Just not only the order that they see the food, the way that we group it, um, immune foods, energy foods, and recovery foods kind of in, in that order. But the fact that when they do go through that food supply that we've got current and future dietitians shepherding these athletes through that food supply at each meal and you know we've we're trying to make food coachable we're trying to group food in a way to where the very sophisticated diverse nature of food can be simplified into actionable executable buckets and decisions per se that the athletes can make and that they can you know make that formative learn what they're doing while they're eating with us so that they can carry that forward away from the facility as a life skill, right? It's, it can be there to serve them for their entire life. And of course, we're very concerned about what happens when these athletes' competitive days are done and, and nutrition's gonna be a huge part of it. Which, by the way, stay tuned because Dave and I are working on some fun stuff with that cooking station with the athletes. Don't wanna give too much away, but you'll wanna uh, stay tuned for that because that is going to be fun. Fall camp is here. Uh, kinda take us through what you and your staff's role is to keep these guys healthy, to make it through fall camp, to be ready to go come kickoff. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, obviously it's hot and humid and all the sports that show up, football included, volleyball, soccer, cross country, or those are our early report sports. We'll all be exposed to the elements uh, to some degree. When you wear pads for the first time in that kind of heat, there can be very profuse fluid loss. We can't really replicate what it's like to wear pads because the rules don't allow us to wear pads in the off season. So contact and pads uh, in hot, humid weather is a challenge, right? I mean, that is a day where you're going to find out who's a two pound sweater, a four pound sweater, a six pound <laughs> sweater, an eight pound sweater. And yes, we have 10 or 12 pound sweaters wow. that are lose so much body weight profusely over the course of the practice that we have to, you know, teach them how to drink before they get thirsty use the right types of uh, rehydration profiles to match what kind of sweater they are. Some people are more salty sweaters, some are more uh, dilute sweaters. Uh, some people are amazingly efficient and go out in the heat and hardly sweat at all. So like we've got every kind of sweater there is out there and you, you gotta get to know them. And we actually have some athletes who might have a more of a, even more dramatic challenge in fluid loss to deal with. There are athletes who might have sickle trait where their ability to resolve the burn after an exertion is compromised, that we have to have special buffered solutions to help them make it through the practice. And we take all this very seriously. At the end of the day, we want to make them better at it, proactive, conscious consumers, and minimize the gap from their weight at the start to the end of practice, come in hydrated, do a great job during, minimize how many pounds they lose so that they can bounce back before the next walkthrough in practice. Yeah, a lot of these guys have spent what? six, seven, eight months trying to put on weight to play for a season and fall camp can be hard to keep it on. Yep. Do you sometimes, mm -hmm. are you guys sometimes chasing people down to get them to eat because it's, oh, you might not be hungry out there in the heat and, and working so hard. Appetites definitely get suppressed. People intentionally restrict on the way to practice in the morning. So it's starting hard to get as much down at breakfast, knowing they're walking into an early practice. When they get done, they might be ravenous, but their appetite might be suppressed because their body temperature is still elevated. I mean, when you're sitting there sweating over a plate of food, it just isn't a real <laughs> perfect setting for them to, to eat as much as they need. And then we get back to mid-afternoon snacks and we get back to dinner and we get back to a, yeah, a post-meeting snack at night. I mean, basically we've got food in front of them during their entire conscious hours of the day during camp so that when their appetite does come around that we get as much down as we can to help them bounce back from one practice to the next and to hold their weight. And you mentioned something earlier that I, I neglected to talk about, which was 
they have the ability to cook their own food at our meals. And, you know, when your appetite is kind of in the tank, that might be the difference. Their ability to pick out the ingredients they want, cook and season the food the way they want, eat it over the noodles or rice that they're in the mood for. Um, and, you know, if that's what does it as far as helping them make it through a trying time like camp, then that's really important. And we, we're going to give them every advantage we can. After spring ball, coaches can't have contact with these guys. You can, the strength and conditioning guys can. And, you know, before they hit the field, from your evaluation, from your standpoint, what's the status of the health, of the physique, of the condition of this football team going into fall camp? Well, in the, going into our fourth season here, certainly it's the, the best looking group physically that we've had. Um, you know, these kids have been around here following Zach Duvall's and his staff's program in the weight room. Uh, winter conditioning is our major put on muscle time. We don't run as much. Summer, early summer, we can get some more muscle on these athletes. And then oh, as far as the football team goes, the last uh, six to seven weeks are not as productive because we run in the heat and we kind of level off. We basically need to get that muscle in shape so that it can deal with the burn of exertions um, and then it can cool itself efficiently. And so, you know, it's, muscle's not something you'd want to add a lot of right before you go to camp. There's a kind of a time in a 12-month cycle where there's windows to attack it, and then there's windows to make that muscle efficient. And so athletes that get sick at a critical period like winter conditioning might be behind on gaining muscle. Keeping them healthy during those off-season windows is very important because in-season, spring ball and, and the regular season is where we're just fighting to hang on to it. That's a maintenance period. We can't train too aggressively or the athletes would go out there and have dead legs and probably pull a muscle. So, you know, not every day of the year is a gain muscle day. And people don't really understand the periodized approach to how we go about doing this. It's why I sit in the weight room office-wise so, office so that I can be there to interface with these athletes while they're training, know exactly what they're going through day to day uh, through each phase of the year. But this is the best looking group since you've been here. Absolutely, yeah, this, these guys have come so far. Um, this is a big, a big boy conference, the Big mm -hmm. Ten. There are some adults on both sides of the ball. Um, you know, when I was consulting and flying around, every time I would go to one of these states in the Big Ten, I couldn't get over the size of the athletes, especially in Wisconsin. Um, and, you know, they're just some, some big human beings up there. And so this is the conference where you'll find a lot of NFL linemen. And, you know, you better have something that can match up on both sides of the ball or, you know, they're going to own the clock and you're not going to get the ball back. And you'll hear Scott talking about stuff like that. And so those are the kind of key learnings that we've gone through here this first three years in developing these athletes to where uh, we're just as stingy with regard to owning time on the clock with that ball. I said since you've been here, but I meant since you've been back. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of people are interested. You, you just talked about that. And I was shocked at, uh, you know, I've been in the Big 12 at the size of the running backs. Yeah. They're massive. And uh, a lot of talk about uh, ja Jaquez Yant and, mm -hmm. you know, him earning the scholarship and just, you know, that's a big dude, right? And, and yeah. a lot of those guys are big. And Ryan Held talked about that's a big deal for these guys is kind of managing what they eat, what they're putting mm -hmm. in their body, where they want to be at weight wise. What's that group specifically been like working with? Yeah, so our running backs, you know, this is going to be as um, rich a year as we've had when it comes to depth in that at that position. And you need it because they take a beating. I mean, those big linemen and those fast linebackers, they, they can do some damage uh, on that group of athletes. And you're probably uh, never going to be as healthy as you are on week one the rest of the season because it's such a, you know, the running backs historically, NFL and, and college, Division One athletics included, uh, take a beating. And so depth is very, very important. And different bodies have different roles. You know, there are some that are much lighter and leaner and quicker out of the gates uh, that you can use, uh, you know, on your early downs and anywhere on the field. But then there, when you get in the red zone, you probably better have in this conference a bruiser. You better probably have somebody that in short yardage when the field uh, options shrink as far as what kind of uh, plays you can run. They can really get in there and you know make yardage after contact, 
and and get some of those tough yards that everybody knows what's coming and still you can block and execute to where you you get the positive yardage and keep possession of that ball and score. So I think we've got that kind of group of athletes in the in the running back group right now. They've all worked hard. They've all made progress. Camp will be key for them to get pads on and and make that last step when it comes to the kind of conditioning that it takes to be game ready. Yeah, it's going to be a huge competition. And, um, you know, going back to what Coach Hell was talking about, that they have to make sure that their bodies are right. How invested have you seen these guys? Because they do have to be right to be able to, to handle this competition that they're about to be in in fall camp. How invested have they been in what you guys do for them and, and the nutrition part of it? Yeah, well, they've they cook at almost every meal. Wow. I, I can't get over this group. Like they're, <laughs> they're fighting for a spot in our what we call our life skills kitchen, and they they are shoulder to shoulder, poking at each other and laughing and cooking and yucking it up. And you know that does a lot for me as a, as a dietitian to see them showing up to use our food supply and even taking the time to stand there and cook, uh, even when they're tired and they probably rather just sit down and eat. These guys are that into it. So. I think that's helping them away from the training table when it comes to, you know, knowing that they're not dependent on going through the drive through for a snack, right? Mm -hmm. Or a lot of college athletes' skill sets start and stop, that they really know what they w would be doing when they would stand over a stove and, and actually be able to cook something. So it starts with cracking an egg and being able to do that and then moving on from there to, you know, valuing fresh produce, lean sources of protein, and putting it over enough carbs to keep their muscle and brain functioning, right, as far as the, the pasta or the rice that they might be building that meal over in a, in a grain bowl or whatever it may be. So I've been really impressed, and I definitely am watching the competitiveness amongst them start to really come out. Like I think it's going to be during the running we saw it here late in the summer, um, and I think we're going to see it here when they get pads on, and there will be some clear you know, leaders of the pack. Perfect segue there. You were talking about all the different um, nutrients that they need to be putting in their body. This podcast would not be possible without Midwest Dairy. They've been a partner with you guys, and I know they're working with a lot of big things with you guys, a lot of uh, fun stuff you're going to get to use in your kitchen. Yeah, we're, uh, we're big fans of dairy. Um, it's one of the highest quality and most valuable protein sources for um, fixing sore muscle, resolving muscle damage, supporting growth. Um, so when we talk about protein to our athletes, we talk about diversifying between animal, dairy, and vegetable sources. Dairy being a category that we define all by itself because it stands alone in its value. So to have partners with local dairy group, dairy groups like the Midwest Dairy folks are fabulous. Um, they come by and say, what can we do to help? You know, pretty simple message. And I've always, always got an idea. Anybody that shows up with that kind of o <laughs> uh, open mindset, I'll have an idea. And so, like, they're going to bring us some freezers for frozen dairy items. They're going to bring us some coolers for ready-to-drink dairy items and yogurt. And they're actually going to bring us some three-minute pizza ovens that we can put in our training table to allow the athletes to build their own um, flatbreads and, and pizzas on awesome. that, you know, well, like cooking, like at the Life Skills Kitchen, they'll have to learn how to make a healthy pizza. But nonetheless, um, we'll put out a lot of unique ingredients and they'll be able to do something that certainly beats what would get delivered to your door at midnight. That's awesome. Was uh, Coach Osborne a big fan of dairy? Yeah, he was. You know, in his most restrictive phase of his diet, um, when it was there was a period where he actually almost went vegan. But like most of our athletes, they usually don't stick with um, full court press when it comes to ve vegan approach to eating for very long. And sooner or later, they, they go back to animal proteins. Dairy is usually one of the first things they let back in. Well, Dave, we appreciate your time. Always fascinating mm -hmm. to talk to you. And we're just scratching the surface. So much goes into what Dave and his team does, especially now that, hey, season is here. There's no COVID. You're, you've got all your teams back, and, and they're working out and uh, hitting things hard. It's volleyball team we've been hearing how hard they've been working as well so we're going to continue to talk with you about the process and what nutrition does for these athletes hopefully get some athletes in here that have really benefited from what you guys do but this should be a fun podcast series so we thank midwest dairy for putting it on and allowing us to, to kind of talk some nutrition i know you're happy about that right absolutely
Thanks again to Dave Ellis. We've got much more to come with Dave and the impact of the performance nutrition with our Nebraska student athletes. And this podcast series is brought to you by Midwest Dairy, representing your local dairy farm families. Make sure and subscribe to the Huskers Radio Network podcast wherever you listen. And thank you for listening. I'm Jessica Goody for the Huskers Radio Network.